Carpe Diem VPN. Seize the network. Hey everyone, it's Tim from Carpe Diem VPN here. And I just finished an SD-WAN CPOC not too long ago. And during that CPOC, we did some fun SD-WAN design considerations. And so I thought I'd make a fairly quick video and just talk about some of them because I know a lot of people out there are facing probably similar challenges in designing and implementing their own SD-WAN solutions. So first, what we have here is Data Center 1 and Data Center 2. They are running different BGP AS numbers, and they're both running EIGRP, although not between them. Each data center has a data center core represented by Moonwalk here and Toucan on the right. They also have a WAN distribution block, notice uh, represented by Chick-fil-A and OWL, and then a pair of CE routers, each connected to a different MPLS provider and then a firewall connected to the internet doing a uh, NAT translation. So at the DC head ends, what we've done for this CPOC is we've connected the SD-WAN routers to each CE and also to the um, firewall, and then ultimately back to the WAN distribution block for service side uh, VPN routing. We've done the same in uh, Data Center 2, exactly the same setup. Now, as we move kind of south into the rest of the network, what we have is two uh, MPLS providers, MPLS and Metro E, and then our public internet cloud. So these are the three different transports that uh, the customer is using and that they want to be able to build IPsec tunnels over and build an SD-WAN fabric over. Now, in this case, none of these three clouds are able to route through each other. So right off the bat, we have a design consideration that we need to restrict the color of our fabric IPsec tunnels, which is to say, under normal circumstances, if a uh, if a color or a transport has connectivity to a different color or transport, if we want to, we can allow an IPsec tunnel to be build, built cross color, which would be something like this. I'll just annotate real quick. So like say from an IPsec perspective, we could allow a tunnel to be built across this transport and say these two you know, up in their clouds actually had crosstalk or, or work that way. We could allow it to work like this where we could build a tunnel over that color or over both colors rather. Uh, in this case, that's not something that we can do. So uh, we'll go ahead and get rid of that. Um, so what we instead have to do is we have to restrict our colors, meaning that from an SD-WAN perspective, the SD-WAN has to be aware that the only IPsec tunnels that are allowed to be built are really the only ones that are possible to be built would be something like this, where we, we stick to our own color and that's an IPsec tunnel. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. So that's the first design consideration is whether or not the transports that we're using, the colors that we're using, uh, will be able to build traffic across each other. Now, if we had multiple internet clouds here instead of multiple MPLS, this would be a real possibility. So say that we had a, you know, Metro E, instead of Metro E, say that we had biz internet and pub internet, or in real world terms, say that we, had, we were using um, like, uh, Cox Internet Services and, say, Verizon Internet Services, right? And we know that Cox and Verizon have somewhere up in the Internet cloud, they have kind of cross-connectivity. So it might be a design consideration that we allow tunnels to be built, starting with the blue, you know, say, Cox Internet color, and then knowing that, it, you know, up in the cloud we have cross-connectivity, and then we can allow IPsec tunnels to be built through the Verizon color. Now, this... When we do this, it does increase the number of tunnels because in addition to the cross-color tunnel, of course, they'll also build like the, the, the same color tunnel. So, so there's some design considerations there as well as far as how many IPsec tunnels we want to allow to be built. Obviously, more IPsec tunnels equals more redundancy and flexibility, but it also increases the load on our routers, our SD-WAN routers, in terms of number of IPsec tunnels that we have to send probes across, that we have to, you know, BFD keep alive, and just keep that that IPsec tunnel up and working. So now that we talked about the first design consideration, which is our ability to build our SD-WAN fabric, uh, let's take a step back and actually talk about uh, something else that was important to the customer, which is a migration. So in this case, we were talking about having you know, installed our SD-WAN fabric, we've got branches running it, we've got data centers running it. How do we bring in our legacy sites? First of all, how do we keep uh, business operations while that migration is taking place? And then ultimately, what do we do to, to bring them in? 
with any migration, with any SD-WAN migration strategy, what we have to consider is what are the transports or, or underlay connectivity that the uh, legacy site is going to have? Because that's going to determine where we can bring in that, uh, that legacy site and, and kind of get it connected to the SD-WAN fabric. So what we did in this case was we had a, a, a branch, which is uh, represented by Ballet here. And this branch is just a legacy site. It has connectivity to MPLS. And so because it has connectivity to the MPLS, we need to choose an MPLS uh, site, or we need to choose a site that has MPLS, but also has connectivity to the SD-WAN fabric to bring it in. Now with this design, it actually becomes pretty easy because we have CEs terminating our MPLS connectivity in each data center instead of going straight to the S2N routers. That would make it extremely complicated and not really possible to do a, a handoff there if we terminated directly on the S2N routers. So when we talk migration, we're really talking about keeping some kind of connectivity to the underlay outside of the SD-WAN and then being able to, to connect it to the SD-WAN. So here, here's how we did this. So, so we'll go one way and then we'll go the other, and, we'll, and, we'll, and then we'll look at the CLIs. So in DC1, DC1 is running EIGRP100, and so we're going to take our data center route, or, or we're going to supernet our data center route. So we say 10100/16. So within the data center, of course, running within the EIGRP domain, we've got lots of specific EIGRP routes. You know, routes for servers, routes for point-to-point -point links, uh, so on and so forth. And DQ here is participating in EIGRP. So, so it has a full EIGRP routing table of uh, the data center. And of course, because of the SD-WAN, it actually has the, the, the full routing table of the SD-WAN uh, routes coming from the branches as well. So as an example, you know, take, take branch one here, 10100/16. DQ, through the magic of uh, OMP and redistribution, say, you know, here we go right, is going to learn those EIGRP routes from Chick-fil-A, and DQ will have those EIGRP routes as well for the fabric. So far, so good. Now, what is DQ going to do? Now, DQ is connected to the underlay. It is not connected to the SD-WAN. It provides connectivity to Bravo 5 and Bravo 6 to the MPLS transport, but it is in the underlay, which is to say that it is not participating in the SD-WAN fabric at all, it isn't even aware of an SD-WAN fabric. It just, it's just here, connected to the MPLS as a normal legacy router. So when DQ has all these EIGRP routes from the data center, from the branches, even from the other data center, really, it's going to inject some of those routes into the underlay in order to provide connectivity for ballet. And rather than simply redistribute EIGRP into BGP, which is what we're running with the provider, what we did in this case was we supernetted. So we took every site and we supernetted that site, 10200, 10300, so on and so forth. And we just created network statements in BGP. And we'll see this in a, in a minute here once I finish this great explaining it all. We, we created network statements in BGP and then we did an aggregate address. So that into the, so advertised to the underlay, to the divider, we only have the supernets instead of the more specific routes. So that means Ballet is going to learn the supernets for all of the SD-WAN sites and the data centers. Okay, so, so the important thing is that we're not redistributing EIGRP in the BGP here. We're actually controlling our redistribution and instead just using network statements to inject prefixes into BGP. So that's how we're getting routes from the current data center and from the SD-WAN into the underlay for Ballet. So let me go ahead and back uh, some of that out. Okay, now from the ballet side, ballet is just doing what it always did, and it's sending its route. Actually, I think it actually sends a slash 24 here. So I think it actually sends a slash 24, but we'll see that in a minute. And it just advertises to the MPLS carrier as normal. And our carrier is gonna advertise that to DQ, to Crow. Technically, it's gonna act advertise it to Charlie 12 as well. But Charlie 12 being an SD-WAN router is going to receive this prefix for 10.99.0.0 in, the, in uh, VPN 0 or the transport VPN. So it's actually not really going to be able to use it for user traffic. It's just going to sit there in the underlay and be more or less useless. 
But here at DQ and Crow is where we're going to have the make the magic happen. So DQ is going to selectively redistribute BGP into EIGRP. We're using a route map. We're using a route map and a prefix list for this purpose. Because if we did just a straight just uh, redistribution from BGP to EIGRP, we would also get all of these point to point links. And we don't want the point to point links for our underlay living inside what this all essentially is the service VPN, by the way. So this is this is what's called the service VPN from an SD-WAN perspective, right? So on the on the land side of Bravo 5 and Bravo 6, this is the land side of Bravo 5 and Bravo 6 from its perspective is say VPN, I don't know, one, which is the service VPN. So when we come to the backside of DQ, backside of Duncan, when this stuff gets sent to Chick-fil-A, that's now in the service VPN. So you can kind of imagine the DMARC is right here. Okay, so when we redistribute from BGP underlay to EIGRP service VPN, we need to be selective about that. We don't want to send in our underlay prefixes and, and, and just muck up the routing table. So we use a route map, we use a prefix list, and we'll see that here in the config here in a minute. Uh, and we're only going to send in these prefixes, the prefixes for the sites, the service prefixes specifically, the user prefixes for the sites that are still legacy. If there was five other sites here, we would take those sites. So like say if there was one here, right, and say it was connected to MPLS, and it was 10 dot, I don't know, 80. Dot zero, dot zero, right? We would advertise that in, and it would go up here, and we would add it to our prefix list when we redistribute in there. And we do the same thing over here on Pro, right? So because we wanted to live in both both data centers for redundancy purposes and for reachability purposes, so it'll happen the same way. Pro will redistribute to Owl, and then Owl will advertise through BG, uh, EIGRP to Bravo Seven. Charlie five, and those will be those will be external EIGRP prefixes, 10.80, 10.99. These will be external EIGRP prefixes, and then now from an SD WAN perspective, Bravo five, uh, seven, Charlie five, Bravo five, Bravo six, all of those will advertise it to vSmart, and vSmart is our route reflector or our control plane for the SD WAN fabric, and then vSmart will reflect all of that out. So that's how our route reachability will go all the way from our legacy branch, or yeah, legacy branch to say our SD-WAN branch, right? So let me back, back all this out and let's jump in the, let's jump in the CLI. So I can back this all up, back all this out. There we go. And uh, jump into the CLI and we'll take a look at that next.